We've never been this far west before. We're in the Republic of Ireland. We're in Galway Bay. We're right in the tip, the inner tip of Galway Bay, at a town called Kinvara. And we're standing in the harbour, and the sun has just broken through the clouds and is glinting off the water and illuminating the red boat and the green boat and the yacht that's moored up here against the stave. And we're here to meet a wonderful Irish singer-songwriter. Declan O'Rourke's seventh solo album, Arrivals, has been in the official UK Folk Albums chart for months now. And when I first heard it, I thought this is such a beautiful, poetic, stripped-back set of songs, produced by none other than Paul Weller. I'd love to know more about the man who wrote these songs and about why he's made his home here in Kinvara, on the very western coast of Ireland. So that's what we're here to do today, to walk with him through the town and hear his music. Declan, good morning. Good morning, Matthew. What a beautiful, beautiful morning it is to be in the harbour at Kinvara. I think the gods are smiling on us with this weather <laughs> after a crazy week of rain. and The sun is we're out. We're very lucky. It's yeah, great. it's brilliant. You and picked a good time. Tell us about Kinvara. What sort of a place is it? Well, it's a, it was a fishing village traditionally and a very busy port many years ago. Before the roads were good, all of the trading was done by boats from here back and forth to Galway and what have you. And now it's just a quaint little beautiful place. What sort of community is here now? Really nice people, a lot of artists and... Um, a lot of musicians? A lot of musicians and a lot of people who are kind of activists and very socially aware too. So it's a really great community. Lots of lovely people, yeah, it's nice. And how long have you been here? Because you, you, you haven't li- always lived here, have you? I've been here 14 years now, which I've realised is longer than I've been anywhere else in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so you're feeling kind of settled so, here? Yeah, I feel quite settled here, I love it. And are you inspired by the place to write songs? I think I am, almost accidentally, if you like. You know, that last record I made, Arrival, seems to be quite a few references in there, unknowns to myself even, you know. And but never let it be said that this podcast isn't well planned because you have a song called The Harbour and here we are at The Harbour and I wondered if you might sing it. I'd you know, to. call me a producer. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind? I'd be honoured, yes. Oh, that would be fantastic. Johnny cooks a steak from Little's on a Friday night After spending all the week long working hard laying tiles Tells me she made me feel so used but I leave all that behind See I was making real good money then I had ten men laying tiles And he's standing in the doorway of our little kitchenette Puffing on one of these new crazed electric cigarettes I imagine he must get lonely, but if he does, he keeps it all in jail. But when you're guarding a prison, how do you choose what to be? I've got an older friend named Pete who sometimes helps me with my trees Likes to talk about old girlfriends and the places that he's been He talks about his hippie days and how he settled here by chance But he's always been a hippie since the time he lived in France And he plays all kinds of music and sometimes he might sing Where will all that go to when we miss him now some spring? I like to listen to him talking, he tells 
von ihren wise tears Says when you're holding a hammer Everything looks like a nail Now me, I'm out here in the world Singing my songs from town to town And giving everything I have To get this thing of mine airbound So maybe someday I can live just like the fisherman Who stays close to the harbor And only takes enough just for today But for now I think I'm somewhere in the middle of the sea I'm sailing on a suitcase filled with dreams of what might be And I look for pretty stories for the singer's mind And fill my sail When you live by the weather Every wind has a Fantastic. Thank you, and you Martin. see the gulls going round above oh, your head as you were singing there, and right. you can hear the water lapping. It was absolutely wonderful. I'm just wondering while you were singing whether the characters in the story would recognize themselves, and are they, are they people from Kinvara? Oh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's very interesting when you're writing about living people, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, do you feel a sense of responsibility? You do, and a bit of care, and you, you have to be careful, and you know kind of let them know you are going to expose them to the world I think um, but you know I had some uh, very welcoming responses so that was nice and you, you, you hope that you're honouring people as opposed to slating them or, or criticising them or <laughs> and have you played the song here in Kinvara before? I have a few times here and there I suppose but never on the pier here you know so it's quite Feel nice different it does, it's lovely. This spot is kind of quite significant for me in many ways. Uh, some days after school, my little boy actually, when I pick him up from play school, or we come here and feed the seagulls. And My granddad inspired some of these songs, or his painting. He, he came from Canberra a long time ago, and he died in 1980, but his paintings are still showing up. He uh, left here and moved to Ipswich, actually, lived there to study art for a few years, but there's still paintings showing up, and just about when you say showing up you mean finding them in your attic or finding them in, in people reaching out and saying we heard you talk about your granddad and I think I have one of his paintings you know and somebody sent one to me about a month ago and it's literally a view of this pier from, just right probably here. from over there you know and like he left here in 1937 so uh, oh, it's amazing oh. to see those things and you know and it's like oh that's very special to Was me. that one of the reasons why you wanted to come back here? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I grew up looking at paintings of this place and they were really dreamy and beautiful and uh, they were all around the family, you know. Obviously, it was very special to him, even though we'd left here a long time ago. So he kind of gifted us this place in a way and there was a draw to it, you know. Well, there's an art centre up the hill here where I think you had an exhibition of his paintings. That's right. Should we Just, walk over there? Yeah, let's do that. Sounds <laughs> lovely. So Declan, I'd like to understand a little bit about your journeys in life because you've had some rather epic journeys. Where were you born? Born in Dublin and lived there until I was 10. My parents emigrated to Australia and they were kind enough to bring us with them. And where did you live in Australia? I lived in Melbourne. My mum was from quite a large family so 
She was feeling a little homesick and running up big phone bills. <laughs> and uh, I think at that point they decided, you know, maybe it's best to go home. So how long were you in Melbourne for? Four years that time. Right. And but, how, did um, you settle in all right? Because it's quite a big a jump to go from Dublin to Melbourne it's a big as a jump. 10-year-old. Yeah, I guess it seems bigger than it is, or at least it felt not so tough, you know. People were very kind there. And were you making music then as a, as a young lad? Well, what I found was, you know, I wanted to play music. In schools there, they had great music programs, which we didn't have in school here, you know. Like in high school, they had drum kits and pianos, and you could go and play there on your lunch break. And so it was there that I actually picked up the guitar. How did you get your first guitar? It was a chance little incident. My family was visiting some friends and we stayed in this house. It was a priest's house actually over the weekend. And I found that there were two little nylon string guitars around the house. And I snuck off at a couple of points and just sat holding the thing, <laughs> trying to... And, um, as I was leaving, this young guy, I guess he was a deacon, a training priest or something, he ran out after us, banged on the car, you know, said, I think he left something behind. And so we were perplexed, and he came out and handed the guitar to me and said, I think this is yours, you know. It happened to be my 13th birthday, so... Wow. You know, it was and nice. did you take to it straight away? Pretty much. I mean, I, he showed me a couple of chords, I think, and I was noodling away for about a year. That was the year before we came back to Ireland. When I got back here and I met some other kids who were playing, that was when I really threw myself into it. You know, once you meet some like-minded individuals, music is a very social thing, isn't it? So I never looked back after that, you know. I was kind of eating and sleeping it from that point onwards. So did you start to listen to traditional Irish music a lot at that time, or, or were you listening to more contemporary? Well, I was raised on a, a kind of a healthy mix of music anyway. My parents were quite eclectic. Irish music certainly featured heavily, but, you know, that was in amongst Motown and blues and whoever was uh, really popular, you know. But my, my parents, they liked good music, you know. My granddad then, he was into the ink spots and... You know, my dad loved classical guitar and flamenco. And Didn't you record an Ink Spot song or, or sing an Ink Spot song? I did. Once? I wrote one. It was like a, what, a pastiche of an Ink Spot exactly, song. Exactly, yeah, you know, to try and slip it into their catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was a lot of fun. I recorded it with John Prine, actually. It was. And he had a, a house near here, didn't he? John Prine, yeah. the country singer. Holiday House, yeah. Yeah, so you must have become friends. We did, and we had a lot of great nights here, you know, in the corner of a bar singing songs together. And wow, and, uh, that must have been quite some evening. It would be planned to be a very small thing, but I think John secretly liked all the locals turning up, so he would sneak the word out to somebody, and before he knew it, you'd walk in and you'd be... Pushed like against that, the wall. Get, trying to get a spot, you know, <laughs> in the corner. But it was great fun, yeah, really great memories now. We've arrived at the art centre where your grandfather's paintings were shown. Let's go inside, yeah. shall we? Let's. So we've come inside, I've got the guitar out. And there's an exhibition going on here by uh, a young artist, I gather, with pictures all around the walls. Of, a lot of them are about social media, I think, in okay, this exhibition. Yeah. What, what did this place used to be? This was a courthouse originally, and... Uh, it's not a huge room, is it? So we're on a room. kind of slightly raised dais here, yeah. and then down below. So maybe the judge and jury used to sit up here, do you think? And I then would say the, the bench was up here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Elevated in the higher position, you know. As part of our exhibition for my granddad here one of the local guys a lovely guy said i'll look up some family history for you and he found a couple of court records i don't know if it was this one or the one in galway but one colorful ancestor of mine was arrested for drunken disorderly or something and there was an account you had the whole court laughing anyway and you know <laughs> bit of a can't remember the words, a bit of a <laughs> probably <laughs> And the other thing was that um, I have an interest in the famine. Uh, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine, yeah. And I know that during that here, the guy who owned this town and, you know, the whole area, hundreds and hundreds of acres, uh, was coming to a meeting here with various other landlords. Quite a few of the poor gathered around him and said, please, you have to do something for us. And apparently he made good on his word and did something. 
But at one of the meetings he attended here, he contracted fever and was dead three days later. So, oh goodness. so you understood how short life could be in those days here and how, how harsh conditions could be. Absolutely, yes. So now listen, you're going to play a song called In Painter's Light, yeah. which reflects your grandfather, but does it also reflect your own interest in art? Was drawing and painting something that you were interested in when you were younger? It sure is, and in fact when I wrote the song, I, I thought it was about me and um, my own early kind of desires and passion to be an artist from very young age. So did you draw from a young age and paint? Yeah, from as far back as I can remember, I drew well. Anyway, I never got to paint really. Uh, it's still something that I intend to take up, which hence the song was kind of an affirmation. You know, I said, if I say this out loud, then I'll have to do it, you know. I still draw from time to time, but I guess at a certain point in my life, when music became a serious thing, it's so all-consuming that it, it kind of the road forked. And it was really one or the other. I don't know, I'm a bit of an all-or-nothing person. You know, you want to do something really well. But um, I played the song, an early recording of the record, to a cousin of mine. And as soon as she heard that, she said, is that about Grandad? And I was like, mm, I hadn't thought of it that way. But the more I listen to it now, it's, it's equally, you know, paints his life here, wanting to paint fishing boats and probably more than mine. It was an interesting thing the way it happened. The exhibition actually took place just as I was finishing the record. When I was working with Paul Weller, we had nine songs and he was saying, you've got three minutes left on the final go and write me another song. And that was the one I, I, I came back with. And I kind of had it half sketched, if you like. But uh, it was interesting that the exhibition and the record were kind of circling each other. and Came formed. together in your head. Yeah, yeah somehow, yeah. yeah. One day I'll be an artist I will rise up with the dawn Mix colours for my canvas through the silence of the morning in painter's light. In the quiet there, a fishing boat will gently breathe in its colours and reflect across the sky filled scene in painter's light. I don't know what it is that's kept me from it all this time. Best way to kill the thing you love is if you never even try. But I won't let my love die. When I was but a boy, I fell in love with how the hand with just a pencil could create a flower, a face, a country landscape And how an artist could wear his heart right on my sleeve And I got lost in every line until that boy became a man And childhood dreams of exhibitions somehow stayed a secret plan and you know yourself, my friends, what life can do with plans. This old game I'm in demands that I commit the perfect crime. Say each man kills the thing he loves if you just give him enough time. But I won't kill. Just tell us what, what was in this room when, when the exhibition was on, what, what sort of paintings were on the walls? Sure, well, we had uh, approximately 40 paintings 
here, which was all the room could take. And I tell you what was really interesting that happened. The day we decided to have an exhibition of his paintings, he'd never had an exhibition and he hadn't been ever back here as a grown man in a way. But there was a local man here, an elder of the community, who contacted me and said, I heard you talk about your granddad on the radio. I think it's the same man who was friends with my father. So this man, John, his name. Anyway, he invited me onto his local little community radio show to talk about my granddad. He said, I know you're famous, but I want to talk about your granddad, not you. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was lovely, you know. But during that little broadcast, he said, are there any paintings still around? I said, there's so many of them around the family. So I said, we should have an exhibition of his paintings for the first time ever, bring him back to Canberra. And unknowns to us, there was a lady nearby listening. And she had moved here in the 90s from the States. And she was renovating a little cottage down by the water there. And one of the builders was out in the kind of the barn and loft. And he came in and he was carrying this thing wrapped in old dirty linen cloth. And he said, I found this in the roof of the barn. Don't know what it is, but it looks like some kind of old painting. And it was really bad condition, like something had fallen down a chimney, if you like, just black. She said she could make out the silhouette of a head. She had owned and ran a gallery space in San Francisco for years. Of all the people to find this, you know, she thought, this can be saved. I'm interested in this. It's like really curious. And she said, I didn't have the money at the time to get it restored. So I had somebody put a, a wax seal over it to preserve it. And it sat there for... 15 or 20 years, with a note to her children, in the case of my death, this has to be restored, you know. And about three months before our radio show, when we decided to have an exhibition, she had finally taken it to somebody and got it restored. And she said, the face of this young man appeared and it was an oil painting. And so she was fascinated. Who was, there were no oil painters in rural Ireland, you know, generally speaking, back then. And uh, so she called me up. I'd never met the woman, and she contacted me and said, I have this painting here. I heard you talk about your granddad. Maybe it's the same person. And so I asked her to send me a picture of it. You know, that night I was so curious. And as soon as I looked at it, I could see my son and my nephew. I could see, you know, it was... So the family resemblance was really powerful. Oh, instant. And it was basically... so. In answer to your question, what hung around the walls here, we had a lot of paintings, including his last one, which is a self-portrait in 1980, and he's, you know, becoming an old man at that stage. He died at 64. But this painting then was, as far as we could tell, his earliest painting, a self-portrait, when he was about 15. And we thought straight away, well, we have the start and the end, and whatever falls between is the exhibition. Oh, you know? wonderful. It must have been such an emotional evening when it opened. Oh, it was really very emotional, yeah, yeah. Did you sing? I didn't sing at it, no, no. I, I thought it was, it was not my day, it was his. You know, uh, I gave a little opening speech here and uh, managed to get through it without getting too emotional, which was great. <laughs> but um, we had maybe 40 members of the family from all over too and kids and it was very sweet, you know. And we felt like we... We brought him home and away, and you know. You felt his spirit here with you? Absolutely, yeah, it was really nice. Hello, James. Hi. Brian, how are you Hello. doing, boys? Inez. Hello, Inez. Hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> Declan, you, you mentioned the famine, and there was a big project of yours on the previous album. What attracted you to that as a subject for writing and, and inspired you to write about it? Funnily enough, <laughs> everything seems to be anchoring around my granddad at the moment. He had a kind of a mysterious past, you know, and around the year 2000, we were doing some family history, trying to find out more about his past. And on his birth cert, it said he was born in the workhouse. And, you know, we'd heard the word workhouse before, but nobody really knew what that was and what it meant and I was keen to find out more and not long after I, I happened upon a book in one of those bargain bins you know 
them it's called the workhouses of ireland so i thought well there's my chance to find out and uh, picked it up for a pound or whatever it was and i remember getting on the bus that evening coming home from town upstairs and i opened it and literally first page it said you know in this book we will talk about this and usually mostly it's records that survive about the famine very few personal accounts but he said slowly as i studied this people started to appear you know and he said the man who carried his wife home from the workhouse mile after weary mile to their old home and was found dead the next morning with his wife's feet held to his chest as if he'd been trying to warm them oh my goodness and that was just like oh. You know, just extraordinary image. Yeah, and I thought it was so powerful and kind of had a lot of beauty in it. I think, and you know, I think over the years I tried to examine really why it seemed so powerful, and you know, to be able to give something like that in, in your own darkest hour, to give the last of your own warmth to somebody—that's the definition of everything, love and life. family, isn't it? Life, yeah. you know, and. I thought it was something that people needed to hear. I, I, I was shocked at why didn't everybody know this story to begin with. But, but just for those who don't know about this episode in Irish history, just put it in context for us. I think we lost a million people to starvation and immigration and, you know, victims of a class system. And obviously we were a foreign colony at the same time. But, you know, it's definitely the most significant thing in Irish history. And the crops failed? The crop failed, you know, but really what happened was that over a long period of time, hundreds of years perhaps, the poor had been squeezed to a point of subsisting on one single crop that would provide. But, you know, there were problems Which with the that potato, alone. Was the it, potato. Yeah, yeah. It only grew for six months of the year, obviously, so people were running a huge gauntlet anyway and the introduction of the potato would say 150 years before the famine had because it was kind of like a super crop you know the way they talk about kale these days but it gave more nutrition per pound than any other vegetable there was and it could grow anywhere so you know the poor thrived upon it thrived is maybe the wrong word but they were able to survive on much smaller pieces of land and subsistence. And the population actually doubled in that 150 years. And, you know, it was like a ticking bomb, really. And um, when the crop failed, they had really nothing to turn to. It was their last straw. You know, it, it created the beginning of the Irish diaspora, too. That wave of emigration that's never really stopped since. And they now say... There are something like 80 million people in the world that claim Irish heritage, and yet we still have only 6 million people on the island of Ireland, I think, you know, and it was almost nine before the famine. And it has never recovered those numbers. Not that I think that's something you wish for, a huge population, you know, but it's probably unique in first world nations to have a population number that's so low compared to you know, 150 years ago or so. So that image that you described of the man and his wife was a hugely powerful image of the kind of starvation, the death, the tragedy that was going on here. But how did you get your way into it when you wanted to start writing songs about something so vast, something so significant in the history of the island? Yeah, well, I felt that as an artist, if you give a tiny drop of something distilled, it contains everything. And one of the things that was very powerful for me as I read more about this and really kept studying, going back to my feelings, my original feelings when I read that paragraph, was that I discovered when you read something like that, it seems distant until you consider your own family in that situation. If you say, what if that was my children or my mother and father? Or whatever, that's when you go, oh, so... To me, that was how I understood empathy works. And therefore, it's very important to keep these stories alive. They equip us to deal with things like this that we see in the world. And I think that's why they're important. And do you regard some of the songs that you write as having a political purpose, as, as putting over an argument, as well as telling a story? Never political, no. 
no I'm not interested in politics and we have enough of that in the world you know um, I try to instill hope into my songs and there's only good intentions hopefully healing and just trying to go for the core of things and the human thing that we all share there's a song that you're going to sing for us now called Olympian which is an extraordinary personal story but it, it, it tells a wider story too about migration can yeah. you tell us the story behind that song I can so it's the story of Yusra Mardini a Syrian swimmer and she had to I suppose escape her country she was quite young probably 14 or 15 when this happened and her dream was to be an Olympic swimmer all her life she had to travel incognito and she crossed through Turkey from Syria and Lebanon and there were boats leaving the coast of Turkey to get to Greece and she got into one of these boats under dark night time and the boat got into trouble halfway across full of young and old people she was with her sister I think her sister was with her in the boat too and when the boat got into trouble they knew they were going to drift out into the sea and it would have been catastrophic for everybody so she and her sister and I think a couple of other people jumped out and they basically pulled the boat for something like three hours to the shore of the other side it's an incredible story of heroism I thought and in our times when there's so much apathy towards people on the move and displaced peoples and backlash against them even more so here was a beautiful story to show what people are capable of and she was training to be an Olympian but this was far bigger what she did and that was that was the real Olympic effort. I had the privilege of interviewing her. You um, did not? I spoke to her, yeah, on wow. the BBC World Service. Oh, fantastic. Uh, what an amazing woman Wow, she is, yeah. You're the link now between Yusra and I. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever spoken to her? No. Have you no. wrote the song about her, but inspired by reading about her story? Yeah, exactly. Actually, my wife told me the story. She grew up swimming a lot herself, actually. She's a stunt woman. Yeah, that's what she's done she? for a living for a few years. She's in directing the stunts now, but... It resonated with her a lot too, I think, because she could uh, associate with the memories of getting up every morning as a as a young girl swimming every morning in the sea. And, you know, even some of the imagery was kind of inspired by her memories of, of swimming. Would you sing the song for us right I'm here sure, on the I'm beach? Sure We're will. on the beach now yeah. with, the, with the boats anchored out in the harbour and the sun is here, but there are a couple of spots of rain in the wind, but the sun is still shining. So we'll expect a rainbow to come out while you're while you're singing. Oh, there is one. There is a rainbow now. There just is. coming from the it's mast of the ship. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> over there. Is it Lovely. Just over the sea, which is now a beautiful blue colour. So They'll what a great believe setting. us if they can't see it, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> we can see it. <laughs> Into the water, so clear and blue, the crowds are cheering, willing her through. She wins the heat, but the next brings tears. The dream is over for four more years. Back in the homeland, she strained and striped. Each day she sweated from air a child. To glimpse the gold and the colored rings And give the hearts of the masses wings But darkness came to her Syria With bombs and bullets, the rain of war through burning Lebanon she had to flee her dreams behind her down to the sea into a boat there by dark of night with twenty strangers all taking flight so overburdened 
The engine fails in open water without a sail. They're too far out now, no turning back, nothing behind them to bring them back. The young and old now will surely drown miles from safe harbor without a sound. Into the water so dark and cold. Her and her sister, they pull the boat. Their faces frozen, limbs tired and weak, or the abyss of the agency. Remember when we swam before school. This sea is only a bigger pool. It's just a gold now is in the boat, tied to these rings at the ends of rope. And if the ancients had known of her deeds, she'd be. The pride of all ancient Greece, she'd have the gold and the laurel wreaths. Great Alexander would have kissed her cheek, and from that day forward, most everywhere they'd know the fame of that brave young girl. Lost her home, but who saved the dream and held it gleaming for all to see? Who gave back hope to a world at siege and showed true courage this grace that leads? Who gave back meaning most real again? Ancient and noble Olympian, 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 Olympian. Into the water, so clear and blue. The crowds are cheering, willing her through. She wins the heat, but the next brings tears. The dream is over for four more years. So where are we going now? I suppose we're going up to the castle now, aren't we? Um, this is called Dungura Castle. It's spelled Dungura, D-U-N-G-U-A-I-R-E. But all the locals say Dungora. And is that a historic spot? Well, the funny thing is that's the new castle. Right. That's only been there since the 1300s. On the way, we'll pass the remains of the older one. I don't know what it dates back to, but at least a thousand years. And there's the, the arch of it, it's on a little island, but apparently a lot of the stone was plundered and also used to make the harbour here. And then on the other side of the castle, there's the remains of an ancient ring fort, like an older wooden structure. And you can see it on Google Maps, there's like a, a 
ring of trees, marking where it used to be. So quite a historic quite a location, historic. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And my granddad and my ancestors lived, you know, 100 metres, let's say, from the castle there, kind of facing where the ring fort was. And uh, interestingly, actually, you can see little remains of a cottage to the left of the castle. Yes. That was uh, a fever hospital during the famine. So, um, lots of history around. Yeah. Let's walk around the side here because there's some stone steps that will take us to the seaside of the castle. We're coming along right in the lee of the tower now. And then the sea is on our left. And it's quite a good view back to the harbour that we left earlier on. We can see the boats riding at anchor in the bay. Yeah, absolutely. We are in Galway Bay, really, but this is a nice little hidden shelter from it. All around the west coast, you see that the trees look like smoked heads or something to me. They all look like the hair is blown way back, you know, from the prevailing winds. And it's incredible. We're, you know, the first thing the wind hits off the Atlantic. So a little sheltered spot like this is... Welcome. Treasure, I suppose. Very yeah. welcome, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a very handy stone bench here. Declan, let's sit down when the, when the sun's come out. What a yeah. spot. It's made it's for a us. great Matthew. spot. And you can see the two swans just... Yeah, there seems to be always distance. swans around here, actually, yeah. you know. You get some beautiful sunsets here. It's a, it's a bit of, there's a bit of magic in this place, you know, and I think one of the things that strikes me about it is that even when the weather is bad, it looks epic. You know, it just always has something beautiful going on. I was a city boy growing up. Somehow I was always drawn to this, to the sea here. I can't imagine living inland now. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want to go away from this view if I lived here, I'll tell you. It's absolutely beautiful. I love coming home from wherever I've been touring or whatever, I love coming back here and just shutting the case and closing the door for a while. So how did you first start performing seriously? When did you first make music your career? Well, I lived in Australia from the age of 19 to 24. And when I'd left Ireland, I was very actively trying to write songs. But I didn't really know anybody else who was doing it. And I arrived there and there was, I, I suppose there was an original music scene in Melbourne, but I, I didn't find it. What were you doing for a living out there? I was working on building sites and uh, quite happy doing that for a while. But ultimately, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. It was always going to be music or art. And I chipped away writing songs for a number of years, but always presumed that I was going to find a singer to sing them. Well, somebody else that yeah. would, would sing them. You'd give them away. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't. You know, I had abandoned all hopes of being a singer when I was a teenager and my voice broke kind of landed in my boots, you know. Didn't know what to do with it for a long time. And then, you know, around the age of 21, 19, 20, 21, I discovered a lot of Joni Mitchell's music and I was listening to Jeff Buckley too. They both sang in really high upper ranges and it kind of forced me into the falsetto range. I used to sing along to them a lot at home. I think I learned how to use my voice doing that, but still, it was kind of accidental. And I was writing these songs and never performed them publicly anywhere until I came home around I was 24 and I, I came home I drew a line in the sand I was like I want to go home and make an effort to make music my career didn't know how that was going to happen but it was a big move and within about two weeks of coming home I found uh, an open mic night in Dublin somebody knocked on my door and uh, this lovely man I can remember details he was 48 he had been a family photographer for his whole career, but he had had this epiphany. He was going to give up that and, and pursue music, much like me. And what was he doing knocking on your door? He was going door to door all around Ireland. And he would, he would knock on your door, he'd open the door and he'd say, I'll play a song for a pound. It was lovely. <laughs> and uh, so I got chatting to him. My parents kind of pushed me out the door. He plays music too. And so we were in this conversation. And I told him a bit about what my plan was, I suppose. And he said, oh, you should go to a place called Malloy's in High Street. Every Thursday it's open for open mic. And uh, so 
I said, okay, that sounds like a plan. I went there and I got up, I was very nervous. And the, actually, the guy said, he was shaking a glass while people were coming in. He said, pay or play. I was like, what do you mean? He said, pay or play. You pay two pound to watch or you play for free. So I was like, wow, two pound was a lot then. I said, can I think about it? They came back around about 10 minutes later. He said, well, what is it? I said, okay, I'll play, you know. I got up really nervous and played two songs. My leg was shaking like crazy. But by the time I got down, I was exhilarated. I was so, it was like instant addiction. And um, I went back the following, and didn't miss a Thursday for the whole of that year. And that was early January. And I had a little diary, like one of those, you know, from the betting shops. And I used to write down everywhere I played. And there was over 140 entries that year from, wow. from never playing anywhere live before to that and uh, you've suddenly found the place that you belonged oh it was it was like instant yeah this is where I need to be in fact in the room that very first night there was a songwriter who was moving to the states all the people on the scene came out to send them off and there was lots of people who became great friends of mine over the years Glenn Hansard Paddy Casey Gemma Hayes Damien Dempsey Damien Rice it was, it was instantly they were all in the, in the room with it. It, uh, and for your first performance. Yeah, yeah. And I, it, was, it was really, I just felt like I was right in the right place, you know. I wonder if you sing another song for us here. I'd love to. It's a very personal song, this one, isn't it? The it Stars is, yeah. Over Kimbara. Perfect for right by the castle here overlooking the sea. What's the story behind this one? My wife and I were on the way home from the hospital. Can I just ask about your wife, by the way? Yeah. Because you just threw in earlier on that she's a stunt woman. Yeah. Okay. Was she a stunt woman when you met her? A cellist when I met her. She was a cellist. Okay. So how did she go from being a cellist to being a stunt woman? It's a good question. She did a stunt with her cello, I suppose. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, she was studying acting. She had been playing cello for a long time. And I mentioned she was a swimmer too, so she's very athletic. And somebody came in giving a class and it was combat on screen. And she seemed to really enjoy that. And um, she tries it all out on me, you know, it's very dangerous, really. <laughs> but, you know, so she's they really liked good at her the, too. The stage fighting. I think so. And the guy who had been teaching the class kind of made a note that she was really good or interested in this. And she got a call not long afterwards. Would you do a stunt for a Guinness ad? They need a woman to jump off a crane in a red dress. And so she said, OK. They said, the only thing is you're not allowed to rip the dress. And of course, the dress got ripped. But uh, I think she, a bit like me getting on stage, she was addicted at that point And it took over her career. She just went headlong into stunts. Right, what sort of stunts has she done then? She done some oh, big movies? being set on fire. And, oh, she did a lot of things for Vikings and big series like that, River Street. And so she's been set on fire. Mm. What, what other things? Jumped she... off cliffs, knocked over by cars, lots of violent scenes and, you know. Do you worry about her? Not so much as about me when she's trying them out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, of course. I mean, actually, since we had our son... She was moving into the, they call it coordinating stunts now, it's like directing the stunts. So, not so worried. You know. so, so, sorry, I'm sorry we digressed there from the story of the song, The Stars Over Kimbara, because you mentioned her, but, so it's about her and your, your yeah, son, Yeah, so we were, we were on the way home from the hospital, bringing him home, you know, and uh, I was away when she had to go, to the, I was actually on the Celt Connections Festival, and she was in Limerick, which is an hour south of here. Therefore, when I came home and I went to pick them up from the hospital, there was two cars. And on the way home, I was in the car behind and I opened the little dictaphone recorder on my phone and I was talking to him, you know, for years to come. I was saying, you know, we're coming around the corner, we're nearly home and your mum and you are in the car in front of us. So you wanted to keep a record of that first journey that he made with you. Exactly. That you could play to him when he was a grown up. Yeah. Fantastic. So just talking to him and and we were approaching Canberra, we were about maybe 15 minutes away up the road there and I looked out end of January and at one point I just realised that the sky was just so clear almost like a frosty feel in the air but I'd never seen so many stars it was a beautiful night I kind of had to stop the car and I got out and I said oh my god it's the starriest night it's still talking into the phone you know 
and something happened and I heard myself say the words the stars over Kinvara because it was up ahead here and you know that little part of your brain that kind of is watching as a writer kind of the alarm bells went off and I went whoa that could be something but as well as that then you know I've spoken about my granddad a lot and he left here in 1937 he was born here in 1915 and so our son was born 2018 is the first family member born into Kinvara in 103 years. So the song became a kind of a tying together of the generations in a way. Through dark summer nights on his racing bike, your great granddad might go clean. When art classes were done, in Galway town Cycled home The miles between And the moon overhead Led him home as he sped Till the stars over Kinvara Said welcome home Long before I ran to be your old man, I dreamed of living here. Where Atlantic waves, neath Ungura's gaze, keep the air so fresh and clear. I was twenty-five when I first laid on. Where I knew I'd find my children's eyes And the stars over Kinvara said welcome First night I drove you and Mammy home, I pulled over in Ballanderine. I just had to pull in, I had never seen such a sky of gems that gleamed. Oh, Ryan was out, and the starry plow. The night was on display Over the burren, the road and the bay There were ten more lights that shone For each one of our own passed on And I dreamed that my gold too Was shining down The stars over Kinvara said, Welcome home. When the stars over Kinvara said, Welcome That was amazing. I just want to describe what it was like to stand here and watch you singing that song because you've been standing on an outcrop of rock, a big rock, with the castle behind you and the blue sky and the sun around the castle. Was it all right up there on the rock? To, it was to sing? lovely, yeah. It was the perfect place actually for it, wasn't it, really? And it, you can see it on our film of Declan. We filmed that song, so if you want to see it, just go to our website, folkonfoot.com. Now, Declan, you're a very busy man. You've got the album out, but you've also written a novel. What's the subject of the novel? What's the backdrop to that? The story that I shared with you earlier, those few lines I read in that book many years ago, formed the basis of a song. 
which led me to other songs on that subject, personalised accounts from that part of our history, the Great Irish Famine. But that particular story just stayed with me over the years. And in around 2018, I played a concert down in Skibbereen, which is southwest of Ireland. And it's kind of near where that story had come from. And afterwards, a man came up and we got chatting and his father had come from that area. And one thing led to another. And within a couple of days, I ended up, because I was staying around for the week, I ended up being taken to visit the remains of the cottage that had happened in. What, the, the, where the, the yeah, man and his wife, exactly. where the wife had died and you know, all, all of that? Yes. Oh, my goodness. And it was mind-blowing because, you know, I mean, I'm 20 years talking about it and singing about it and... I wouldn't have believed there was anything remaining after that amount of time. And uh, lo and behold, in the middle of, you know, lots of farmland that's cleared and tilled and beautiful manicured fields, there was this kind of outcrop of rock on the top of a hill and the remains of a couple of cottages had been covered by briars and brambles and a few years ago, a gorse fire kind of exposed them. And the man on the land, his family have been there through generations the generations gone right back to the time and he knew where it was and you know just standing there viewing that and they asked me to sing this song while I was standing there it was, it was a very profound moment and I just thought this story is not finished with me and at the same time a book publisher approached me they said we heard you promoting that album and we loved the amount of passion that you have for the subject and the knowledge you've built up on it would you be interested in writing a book? Do whatever you like, a kid's book or short stories, whatever you like. And um, I thought it was a great opportunity. And I had accidentally written a short story a few months beforehand. I was going to sketch out a song one morning. It was about an old woman who lived across the street when we were kids and used to send you to the shop back and forth. We all had one of them, I think. <laughs> but I just kept going and by the end of the day it was 20 pages of a story and I enjoyed it so much if that hadn't happened I probably would have said no when I got this phone call but I thought I can do this and I've spent long enough reading about this and uh, so I spent lockdown in 1846 I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that actually <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was one of the most enjoyable things I've ever done I didn't want it to end actually Declan it's just a, an absolute joy to be here with you in Kimbara and to hear your stories and your songs. I must say I could stay here for months and listen to you talk and experience this magical place, but we have to end this episode of Folk on Port, so I want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing all of that with us. Thank you so much, Matthew. They're very, very kind words and received with just as much goodness, and thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed playing and talking to you guys. Declan O'Rourke in Kinvara. Well, we've filmed all the songs that Declan performed for us here and we're going to add them to Folk on Foot on Film, which is our amazing and ever-growing archive of all the songs that we've recorded on our travels around the UK and Ireland. And if you want to get access to those amazing films, there's more than a 100 of them, you should sign up to become a patron of Folk on Foot. All you have to do is go to folkonfoot.com and click on the Support Us button, and it's very easy to sign up there. You'll make a small monthly contribution, and all that money will go back into making more episodes of Folk on Foot, because we depend entirely on support from our listeners and viewers to keep us going, to keep us on the road. So please do sign up if you can, and you'll get access to all those astonishing films. We love making Folk on Foot, and with your support, we hope we can go on forever. <laughs>